Hi, thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Nada Youssef, and today we have Dr. Robert Bolash, a pain management specialist here in Cleveland Clinic. And today we're taking your questions regarding back pain management. So if you guys have any questions, make sure you type them in the comment section below and we'll read them here live during the session. So before we get started, please remember this is for informational purposes only and it is not intended to replace your own physician's advice. Thank you so much for coming in today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a good opportunity to talk about a problem that we see often. A lot of people suffer with back pain. Some people just for short periods of time or some people for long periods of time. And back pain is a topic that a lot of my patients come in with. In fact, it's probably the number one, whether it be the low back, the neck, neck pain, or the middle part of the back. And there's, there's so many options that we have available to them. So I'm really looking forward to some of your questions uh, that come in across Facebook Live here um, to talk about your pain issues and how we can help you get some better care for your pain. Great, thank you so much. Well, do you wanna tell our viewers um, what you do and kind of give them your title? Sure, so I'm an assistant professor of anesthesiology at Cleveland Clinic. I originally trained as an anesthesiologist and then I spent some specialty training in pain management. And so I work on patients that have a whole host of pain problems, um, including the back pain, uh, with a whole host of treatments, including interventional procedures, minor surgical procedures, medical management, physical management. There's really a whole lot of options uh, for these patients. Um, and I see patients here at uh, Cleveland Clinic at the main campus. Great, thank you. Well, um, to start off, there are many strategies that I'm sure a lot of patients manage pain. Um, when do we go from a general physician to a specialist? When should we go ahead and see a pain, pain management specialist? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, if you're not getting the latitude that you need with the treatment that you're working with at present and you seem to have maximized some of your options, it's the point in time when we seek evaluation with a pain specialist. I just tell people that we like to have uh, them come in when they're having some sort of functional impairment related to their back pain problems. So whether that be they can't walk around the mall as far as they used to, mm -hmm. or whether they can't go to their kid's uh, baseball game, or they can't do some activity that they used to be able to do, at that point it's really interfering with your life. And it's at that time when we sort of look at what options that we have available to people. Um, and there are so many that I hope we get to talk about this hour. Yeah, yeah, and we'll start right now. So I have uh, Michael. Um, can spinal stenosis be reversed? Ah, that's a good question. So spinal stenosis is a condition where the canal or the bony portion of the spine narrows a bit and it happens with time. It's not uh, something that's unexpected, but it's something that you sort of earn throughout your life. So as you go from your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, that canal gets a little bit more narrow. And when the canal gets narrow, the nerves get pinched off a little bit and it causes pain when people are walking for a long period or standing for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So there's so many options that we have for them and they can go from the very non-invasive options like medical management, physical therapy, showing people how to walk in a different way in order to open up that spinal canal. Or there's even interventional options, there's different types of injection type procedures and even surgical options that our surgeons sometimes remove part of that bone that's pinching this, this nerve. So there's a whole host of things there that, that can be done from very non-invasive to minimally invasive to things that are done through a needle to surgical options. So a whole host of options. It's a real common thing that we see, especially as people kind of get up there in years with, um, with age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And we have Alice. How often do steroid epidurals lead to permanent elevation of pain caused by bulging discs? Oh, that's a good question, Alice. Um, uh, epidural steroid injections have a very unpredictable uh, outcome. So if I had 100 people that all had an epidural steroid injection and 100 people would have 100 different responses. There's some people that'll get months or years of pain relief. There's some people that'll get weeks of pain relief. Mm -hmm. And there's other people that'll get forever type of pain relief. Um, so it's really a, a little bit unpredictable. We know people that are more likely to have uh, less relief and some people that we are a little bit more optimistic about. Um, but your case is, is, is quite specific. Um, and uh, you know your outcome may be different than your neighbors or someone else down the street just because of the, the architecture of your spine. So would the treatment for them be different if it's um, a bigger pain versus smaller pain? Sure, you know, we do vary it based on your response to the previous epidural steroid injection. So someone who maybe gets, let's say, a year and a half uh, response out of an epidural steroid injection, their treatment might be quite a bit different than the person that only gets 
let's say, a week out of, of pain relief out of an epidural steroid injection. You know, it's not really feasible to come in every single week for something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we do vary it based on the response that people had to previous uh, injections. Okay, great, thank you. And then we have Vanessa. What's your opinion of uh, is it flexion versus extension for lower back pain? Yeah, so flexion versus extension. So flexion is when we're bending our spine forward like someone's hunched over. Mm -hmm. And extension is when we're arching our, our back backwards. Mm -hmm. Depending on the pain pathology that you have there, Vanessa, um, there's certain positions that can help or harm uh, different ways. So let's say you have the same pain problem that uh, Mike had called in with uh, earlier, the spinal stenosis. Those patients do a little bit better with flexion activity. Mm -hmm. Why? because with flexion, with bending forward, it's really opening up the spine to allow that nerve to have a little bit more space to, to move around. Uh, so it really depends on your pain problem in order to determine whether you should be focusing more on the flexion-based ex exercises or whether you should be focused on the extension-based exercises. So it's a good conversation to have with your physician and your physical therapist as well. Perfect, thank you. And uh, moving on to Liliana. Uh, when you are diagnosed with DISH, what is the approach to treat it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So uh, DISH is, a, is not a very common disease, uh, but it certainly is one that we see from time to time and is resulting in a significant amount of pain for some patients. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we have a whole host of options for these patients. Whether We first typically start with conservative options like medical management, physical modalities in order to help you get moving a little bit more, to help you function a little bit more. Uh, if that's not getting you where you need to be, then we actually look at minimally invasive strategies to uh, address the DISH disease, um, all the way up to even uh, surgical options for that as well. Okay, great. And I have Danny. How can I relieve, is it sacro sacroiliac? Yeah, sacroiliac is a real common one. I'd say it's definitely one of our top three causes of, uh, of low back pain. So if, if you have a, a sacroiliac joint pain, Danny, it's, uh, you're not alone. Uh, a lot of options for that. Um, so again, medical and physical modalities are a reasonable thing to start with. Mm -hmm. We then often would address that joint pain with a corticosteroid or a steroid injection um, to see whether or not we can help calm down the inflammation that you have in that joint. Mm -hmm. You know, when that's not getting people long-term relief for the sacroiliac joint pain, sometimes we can even do something that's called a radiofrequency. It's when we use a heated needle around the nerves that go to that joint in order to keep the pain away for a longer period of time. So radiofrequency ablation is a technique that can really give some people with sacroiliac joint pain uh, some long-term relief. Great, excellent, thank you. And then we have Karen. Any remedies for back pain for renal patients? Yeah, Karen, you, ha you're, you hit the, head, the <laughs> nail on the head there. You, you really do have to be careful. Um, if you are a, a renal patient, there are certain medications that need to either be avoided entirely or dose differently. Now, what's going on with that? Some medications can really injure the kidney, especially if you have real borderline kidney function. You wanna avoid certain classes of medicines. Those, those would be the things like the Motrin, Advil, Leave that you can buy over the counter. Um, they can really actually injure the kidney a bit more. Uh, there are some other medicines that for renal patients that we have to dose in a different way. Why is that? Because your kidneys may not be functioning as well as someone else, and so your body's excreting the medicine at a slower rate. Mm -hmm. And so we make a dose adjustment based on how well or how poorly your kidneys are functioning. And so we can often find strategies for these people, but it definitely mention um, the renal issues to your pain physician or your internal uh, medicine physician who's treating you for uh, back pain issues because it's gonna require some ad adjustments. A lot of the interventional procedures um, are an option for patients with uh, renal issues as well. Um, but uh, again, make your uh, doctor aware of all your uh, uh, issues related to the kidneys. Great, thank you, very good information. And then we have um, Valerie. Uh, what are my options for degenerative disc disease? Yeah, degenerative disc disease is an interesting one there, Valerie. Uh, Valerie. Um, with normal aging, our discs tend to degenerate a little bit. So we, when we're young and we're in our teens and 20s or even early adulthood, your discs have a lot of water within them. And then over time, they, they unfortunately, they dry out a little bit. And as the disc dries out, it loses a bit of the height. And sometimes when the height gets lost, we can have pain resulting from the disc where some painful nerve endings grow into the disc. Mm -hmm. Or we can have pain from the, the holes in the side of the spine, the foramen, 
um, pinching off nerves on the side. There's a whole lot of treatments. Again, I feel like I'm going back to the same ones. We have the medical management, we have the physical management, we have interventional management. And in some patients with degenerative disc disease, there are surgical options as well, but I, I'd really probably try to exhaust the other options because spine surgery uh, with degenerative dis disease is not quite as successful as some other um, back pain problems. Um, so try the uh, conservative things uh, first. Okay, great. And then I have Wendy, her lower back, her left lower back goes numb after a short walk. Um, does she have a herniated disc? And how does she know? Yeah, you know, Wendy, there's a whole uh, number of reasons why you can have numbness uh, after uh, going for a walk. One potential option is that you have a, a disc problem. The other potential option is that you have a nerve problem. Um, and there's a whole lot of things that could potentially be going on there in the low back. You know, when we, we, we hear someone um, describe numbness, especially with activity, it's something that we do like to check out. So I would uh, actually have an evaluation for that to see what's going on, what's the source of the pain, and then really uh, have a strategy that targets the source of your pain. If we just throw things at you willy-nilly, it's likely that you're not gonna get as good of relief as uh, if you really have a targeted treatment. So first comes understanding the pain problem from the, the symptoms that you have, then may come physical examination, where we're examining and testing your muscle strength, we're looking at sensory deficits or your ability to, to feel areas that are numb or not numb. We might even look at some advanced imaging like uh, MRI, CAT scan, X-ray, and things like that, and then really go after the main cause of the numbness uh, uh, for you to really target your pain problem. Now when, when parts of our bag goes numb, what exactly is happening? Is this a pinched nerve? Is it muscle? What is that? Oftentimes it's a pinched nerve, um, not always, but often. And, and I'll, I'll uh, give you an example. You know, sometimes you fall asleep with your, with your arm hanging over a chair or you hit your funny bone and things like that. You have that nerve type pain and you know what it feels like. Or maybe you have a cavity and the dentist is in there and he touches the nerve. You know what that zinger feels like. Mm -hmm. that's, that's typically the description of nerve type pain. And so we ask patients when they come in for the visit, we say, you know, tell us about your pain. And so when a patient comes to us, they say, well, you know, pain is pain. It's, it's sort of all the same to me. But we actually ask you to sort of describe it because those words, if you say you get electrical sensation or burning sensation, that tells us about a nerve pain. Mm -hmm. But if you said you had achy pain in your low back or pain that changes with the weather, it would tell us about a totally different pain problem. And we could really target your pain uh, treatment based on the type of pain problem that you have. Great, thank you. And I have uh, Tosca. I'm 83, I don't think it's a good idea to undergo surgery, but my lower back pain is not good. Hard to walk and I have bladder cancer. Underwent a spinal fusion when I was 33 years old. What to do? Yeah, you know, Tosca, there's um, certainly a lot of options for you. You know, surgery is not right for everyone and I always think about what's the least invasive option that we have uh, for you. Mm -hmm. um, there are people that have had pain that persists even though they had a back surgery. I know you had yours about 50 uh, years ago, more than 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think having an evaluation of uh, your spine, physical examination, uh, a little bit of a description about your pain, uh, looking at the things that you've tried that haven't gotten you where you need to be, I certainly think actually there are options for you um, that can really be tailored to your specific um, pain problem. In your case, Tosca, I'd probably actually seek an evaluation with a pain physician um, because it sounds like you're a little bit more complicated with having had the back surgery before. Mm -hmm. So if you're in Cleveland area, we'd be happy to see you here at the Cleveland Clinic. Great, thank you. And then uh, jumping on to Dave, what are your thoughts on chiropractic care for lower back pain? Yeah, there's some patients that really get uh, a response from chiropractic manipulation. Those are the, the patients that typically would describe that they have achy pain, mm -hmm. they have pain that changes with the weather, they have pain that just sits in the low back. Um, those are some patients that are really interested in the physical uh, modality for the management of their pain. And we see people do uh, quite well. Um, you know, I look at this pain, at these pain problems as sort of a, a, a soup a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, you throw a little bit of chiropractic in, you throw a little bit of physical therapy, maybe you throw some medication in, maybe you throw an interventional pain procedure, like an injection. And if each one helps you 20%, the final soup at the end is the culmination of all of those together. So I think if you're getting some good uh, results with chiropractic treatment for the low back, I think that that's a, a reasonable um, option. Very, very good to know. Thank you. And then we have Randy. Uh, can you please explain uh, micro 
discectomy, and I've heard that this minimally invasive procedure has helped others with issues similar to mine. Thank you. So yeah, Randy, I'm not a spine surgeon, but I can tell you what I know about microdiscectomy. Microdiscectomy is using smaller tools, smaller incisions, and even cameras with scopes sometimes to remove small portions of the disc. Why a lot of people have pain after back surgery is actually not because of the work that's done on the bone or the nerve or the disc. It's actually because the surgeon needs to remove the muscles off of the spine in order to get down to the target that he or she is um, working on. Mm -hmm. So the idea with the microdiscectomy is to use these microscopic instruments to do the le least amount of disruption to those muscles um, and tendons in order to help uh, your recovery even uh, speed along quicker. We, you know, we see this in other fields as well. They used to, when they take someone's gallbladder out, they used to do a big incision underneath their rib cage, and people would be in the hospital for a long time. Now when you get your gallbladder out, they make a little puncture incision, and it's this camera. Uh, so the back surgeons have just started doing this um, uh, for the spine as well. And the and recovery is much less painful. Usually it's less painful and quicker too. Wow. You know, getting them back onto their feet, doing some therapy afterwards. Great, that's amazing. And then we have uh, Marcy. Uh, what, what do you do when you have epidurals, trigger points, opioids do not help with your pain from degenerative disc disease and fibromyalgia? Yeah, it's, so Marcy, it sounds like you have um, two different pain problems that are treated um, in uh, potentially even two different ways. So uh, we treat the degenerative disc disease a little bit differently than we treat uh, fibromyalgia, so maybe we can certainly take them one at a time. Okay. So when we think about the treatment of fibromyalgia, um, that's a condition where people have a hypersensitivity to pain or their, their pain volume is way turned up, meaning that um, they're feeling painful sensation that other people aren't feeling. So for instance, if I touch my hand and I touch your hand, you're feeling that sensation as a little bit more painful than I'm feeling it just as, as light touch. So it's almost like your volume on your pain sensor is turned up a little bit. We use different types of medications, different types of physical modalities in order to help people with fibromyalgia or chronic widespread pain um, to help turn down that volume a little bit. A lot of that is medical treatment and things that you're able to do for yourself. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the physical modalities, looking at exercise, looking at your exercise program, looking at real gentle types of reconditioning activities um, to help with the fibromyalgia. With the degenerative disc disease, sometimes if we have the ability to identify which disc in turn, uh, is causing you uh, pain. We can often do very targeted procedures based on those discs, um, but we use medications for that as well as physical modalities um, and at times surgical modalities. Um, but uh, and it sounds like you're, you're, you have two pain problems at the same time that might be treated in slightly different ways. So uh, a little bit more complicated one as well. Mm -hmm. sure, yeah. And then Sharon, I'm gonna need your help with this one. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to butcher, can spondylolisthesis, grade three with stenosis and DDD be helped and how? Yeah, so spondylolisthesis, that's a tough one. It took me <laughs> yeah. a couple years to pronounce that one as well. <laughs> grade three um, with stenosis. So let's talk about that word, spondylolisthesis. If you've ever seen a brick wall, when they build a brick wall, they put the one brick square on top of the next brick, on top of the next brick, on top of the next brick, so that the whole wall is straight up and down. When we have something that's called spondylolisthesis, one of those bricks is slid forward a little bit. So let's think about our spine. Usually our spine has each bone lined up one on top of the next, on top of the next, on top of the next. But with spondylolisthesis, it's as if one of those bones is slid forward a little bit. And when it's slid forward a little bit, it can cause pinching of the spinal cord or pinching, pinching of the spinal nerves. Um, that go down to the legs, or even if it occurs up in the, in the neck, it can even go up to the, um, to the arm. Mm. The grading of that is, is grading its severity. Um, so a, a grade three spondylolisthesis is certainly something that you want to have evaluated um, uh, because that tells us that you have quite a bit of slipping of the vertebral body. Mm -hmm. Now, you, your question was about um, what can be done about that. There's a whole lot of treatments um, that come from the surgical arm. Uh, moving that brick or moving that bone back into place to align it with the other um, ones of the spine is an option for some patients. Mm -hmm. For other patients um, who a surgical option isn't something that they're um, the candidate for or not something that they're interested in, when that um, 
vertebrae is slid forward a little bit, it puts a little stress on structures of the spine that usually aren't stressed, and we can develop pain as a result of stress on those structures. So oftentimes we can target those particular areas that have more stress than the average uh, vertebral level and really target those as well. For you, I would, also, I would certainly um, see uh, a pain specialist and perhaps even a spine surgeon to evaluate your spondylolisthesis. Great, and then I have a question from Anne that I think maybe is similar. I have vertebrae pressing on my spine. Is surgery my only option? No, and um, uh, surgery is an option, um, but not the only option uh, for you. Uh, there are a number of things that we can do in order to help stabilize your spine, in order to help strengthen the muscles of your spine, in order to help decrease pain that you may have um, as a result of the, the spine issue that you're suffering with. Um, It'd be interesting to know the area where you have that pain problem, and certainly the treatment may differ depending on that area and to the degree at which you're uh, suffering with the, um, uh, the pinching. Sometimes when we have very severe amount of, of uh, the nerve being pinched, uh, people can lose control of their, their legs or they can lose control of mus muscle tone. And so we, do, we treat that a lot different than if you just have it incidentally found on an MRI or you've been suffering with pain. So it really depends. There's a couple of these things we call red flags mm -hmm. for uh, low back pain. So if you, if you have low back pain that you're not able to control your urine or not hold on to a stool, you're having accidents, that's the kind of thing we want to see people um, in the emergency room right away because that tells us about a, a problem that's going on quickly. Or if you have back pain that's associated with fevers or an infection, could potentially have infection or fevers or an, um, bacteria in your spine. It's something again that we really want to address um, uh, quite quickly. If you're not able to, if you wake up one day and you're not able to move your legs or walk or something like that, again, it's something that we need to address right away. That wouldn't be something that I just call up and say, let's take an appointment in a month. That's something that we need to really intervene on quickly. Interesting. Good to know. Thank you. Um, and then I have Deborah. Uh, what can be done for lumbar stenosis? Um, OA from neck to SI along with spurs. In pain constantly. I have medication sensitivity and I've had ablation of lumbar spine. No relief from those. What can be done? I'm not living my life like I want. Yeah, so Deb, it sounds like um, uh, pain is really impacting you quite a bit. You're, you're losing some of the activities that you really like to do. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like you have a couple of problems. So if you have a, a problem with the sacroiliac joint, we did touch on that one. That was uh, pain resulting from the joint where the spine meets the pelvis. There's a number of interventional options that we have uh, available for you as well. Stenosis is a different uh, issue. Stenosis is describing pinched nerves or describing um, uh, the spinal canal or the spinal cord even potentially being pinched off. So again, we have physical uh, treatments, we have medical treatments, we have um, uh, interventional treatments. Um, and you mentioned that you don't want surgery, but we have surg surgical <laughs> treatments as, as well. Sure. Um, sure. There's so many different ways that we have, and we tailor each person's pain treatment to really what uh, resonates with them. So there's some people that say, like she said, she has multiple medical sensitivities. So there's people may say, you know, I'm not interested in trying a medication. I'm going to try the physical modalities, or I'm going to try the injection type modalities. Or there are people that will come to us and they'll say, I never want to have surgery. And so we say, okay, that's fine. Let's work on some of the treatment strategies that we have. Um, so, so we really tailor it based on the patient. So if you and I had the same pain problem and you wanted to do certain things and I wanted to do certain things, we could sometimes make a pain treatment plan that works for me and one that works for you, even if we have, different. yeah, even if they're totally different. That's very good. Um, and I have Allison. I've read that injections can cause bone density to decrease, resulting to susceptibility to factors and injuries. Can you speak to this? I've had two in my lower back. Yeah, Allison, uh, a good, uh, good question there. So what you're, what you're mentioning is the administration of steroid um, that we sometimes give within these injections. So steroid is just like taking steroid uh, orally. When we give steroid, we get the good effects of the steroid and we get the bad effects of the steroid. And so if, if you ever see some of these people that uh, have you know terrible asthma or, or um, COPD and they're on steroids for a long period of time, they get all the side effects which come with steroid, one of which is decrease in the bone density um, over time. Uh, you can get thinning of the skin, you can get retaining of water, um, you can get susceptibility to infection. 
So you mentioned uh, uh, lowering the bone density. Certainly with repeated injections um, uh, and high doses of steroids over long periods of time, you can get weakening of uh, the bones themselves. That's why when you're meeting with your pain uh, physician or meeting with any of the physicians that are treating you for um, back pain related uh, conditions, uh, they're really looking at the treatments that you've already had, the treatments that they're entertaining, and whether or not the risk and the benefit uh, makes sense for your particular condition. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I think we talked earlier about a person who uh, asked I think they said, um, how long should I expect to get relief from, from an epidural injection? Mm -hmm. Well, we gave two examples. The first one we said, someone got about a year and a half relief and someone got about a week relief. If we did that person who had a, a week's relief, if we had them come back to the office every single week for a whole year or over years, we'd be giving them so much steroid that we'd probably flip that risk benefit equation for them where it would be more risky to give them all this steroid because of osteoporosis, because of weakening of the bones versus the person that comes in every once in a while uh, when they have an acute flare of uh, chronic low back pain. Great, thank you so much. And then I have uh, Patricia. I just had a back fusion on my L4, L5 with a bone graft from my hip. It's been four weeks and my hip is still very painful. How long until it doesn't hurt so painfully? I do not believe in taking pain pills. Yeah, that's uh, a good question there, Patricia. Um, at times when the surgeons do something called a spinal fusion, they fuse the bones with a piece of bone that's taken from somewhere else. Sometimes they'll take it from a cadaver, sometimes they'll take it from uh, yourself. It sounds like you had the, the bone that was taken out of your, your pelvis, which is a common source of where they uh, take the, the bone piece from. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Sometimes we swap one pain problem for another pain problem. So you, it sounds like you got really good relief from your, from your back pain and now you're sore from the area where they took this uh, bone graft from. But you're only about four weeks out and so I'd be really optimistic that you're gonna improve because it takes a long time for a bone fracture to heal. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, if you broke your arm or you broke your leg or something like that, they don't just put the cast on for a couple of days or a week, they're letting it on for a couple of weeks at a time. Why? Because it takes bone a long time to heal um, compared to if you just get a cut on your skin, which heals pretty quickly. Sure. So I, I'd be uh, um, reassured that you, you may be improving with time. You're only four weeks out. I'm glad your back is feeling uh, better and uh, you're, you're uh, hopefully on your way to recovery from the hip pain too. Yes. Okay, and then we have, uh, we have uh, time for just one more question. Um, so I have Edward. I'm always freaking out about becoming addicted to painkillers after surgery. Has anything changed to, the, to reduce the odds of becoming addicted? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, and we have a lot of people concerned about this. We do use pain medication, um, uh, and particularly the opioid class of pain medication uh, after surgery for post-operative pain. Uh, we, do, we can do a very simple risk assessments for people's likelihood or not likelihood for becoming dependent on opioids. And these are actually simple little five question um, tools that we can use in order to determine whether or not you're at high risk, medium risk, or low risk. If you're at very low risk uh, of becoming dependent on one of these medications, they're probably quite safe to use. If you're at very high risk, like you've maybe had an addictive problem uh, in the past, or you have a family history of a uh, severe addiction, um, or certain mental health conditions that come along with it, it may be that we need to tailor your pain uh, care path in a little bit different way. And you know at Cleveland Clinic, I saw this week, uh, they're actually doing a number of surgeries and using opioid-free pain relief. So a lot of these nerve blocks, a lot of these catheters, so there's so many options. So I wouldn't be apprehensive if surgery is something that you need. I think that working with your surgeon, working with the pain specialist uh, uh, at the hospital in order to find a way that's the safest to manage your post-operative pain and that's gonna be effective for you. Great, thank you. Okay, well, I, that's the, all the time that we have for today, so you have the floor. Is there anything you wanna tell our viewers before we let them go? Well, I think um, if you're suffering with a pain problem that is limiting your ability to do some sort of activity that you like to do, whatever that may be, and it's really uh, putting a crimp in your style, I certainly think it's worthwhile to have an evaluation with one of the pain specialists. If you're in the Cleveland area or close to one of the Cleveland clinics that are across the country or even internationally, um, I'd be happy to see you or have one of my colleagues see you to see if we can't uh, get you some better relief. Great, thank you so much. And for more health tips and information, make sure you're following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, Cleveland Clinic, just one word. And thank you so much for watching, we'll see you next time.